Welcome back, geologists, for the last part of the Cenozoic life forms. So we're going to be talking about the remainder of the Miocene, Pliocene, and Pleistocene. And remember that we'll be visit the primate family when we come back to learn about hominids. So let's get started. So let's move into the Miocene. This was a climate change again. It, it warmed up for a little bit, which is important because it's going to start a decrease in change of temperature into the end of the Pliocene. But from Miocene into early Pliocene, we had a warming trend. What caused this to happen? Well, plate tectonics is the story in this one. When we had mountain building, and if you recall from our plate tectonics, there was quite a bit of mountain building during the Miocene, right? That's going to cause rain shadow type situations, creating more arid environments in the interiors of continents, which would mean more widespread grasslands could appear. In the oceans, we have a new life form that starts to radiate called kelp forest. Now, kelp is actually part of the base of the food chain, and I'll give you some knowledge on that. Sea otters don't necessarily eat kelp, but what they eat on does, which would be sea urchins. And so, see, it's a type of algae, and sea urchins will eat the algae in the water to keep it clean. Another thing that was going on in the Miocene that's very noteworthy, remember we already learned about diatoms, but they made a comeback after the Cretaceous mass extinction in a Mongo way. So these were very common in the Miocene and created large concentrations of diatomaceous type material that we learned about earlier in the semester. By the late Miocene, we literally had 95% of what you would note as modern seed plants. So lots of changes happened in the Miocene. But if I could give you one thing to remember the Miocene by, I would say grassland expansion was it. This is where we had huge, large-scale grasslands. Something that evolved in the Miocene I think is worthy to talk about is the mastodon. These are in the same order as mammoths and elephants, so it is certainly a type and coexisted with mammoth, by the way, if you didn't know that. They went extinct somewhere between 12,000 and 9,000 years ago. Really, you can say somewhere near the end of the last ice age, along with uh, mammoths and their relatives that lived at that time. So they would have lived in the woodlands, like spruce woodlands and forests, but they could move out into valleys, lowlands, and swamp areas. But they did not feed primarily on the same things that mammoths did. Mammoths were grass eaters. So these guys had a different shaped tooth from mammoths, and that's one of the main ways you can determine if you're looking at mastodon fossils and uh, some kind of mammoth fossil. Another way is by the tusks. They had straight out tusks where most of your mammoths had curling tusks. And so that was another feature. Their body shape was a tad different as well. Hominoids are going to diverge from old world monkeys before the Miocene and then they split into two groups during the Miocene. Dryopithecines are the first types of groups of hominoids that evolved into an ape-like group, and they evolved in Africa and spread to Eurasia. Sibapithecids are the second group of your ape-like animals that evolved during the Miocene, and they evolved in Africa and spread through Eurasia as well. So these two groups are going to become important to us as we continue our journey through primate evolution. The Pliocene really is most noteworthy for a time of migration. While there are some important animals that did evolve at this time, I think the best story to leave you with for Pliocene is the understanding that migration of mammals occurred between North and South America when Panama joined the two at the hip. So let's look at who came from which side. Armadillos, ground sloths, opossums, porcupines, they migrated from South America into our continent. Going the other direction, dogs, cat, bears, and horses heavily migrated into South America during this time. So towards the end of the Pliocene, our climate becomes a lot cooler and truly starts to begin to have characteristics of the last ice age by the very tail end of the Pliocene. 
In all fairness, most of the Pliocene was much warmer than it is today, so don't think that the entire thing started the Ice Age. That's just not the case. But this is a fairly short epoch, but a very important time of migration for mammals. That brings us into the Pleistocene epoch. So first and foremost, Pleistocene was not that different from what we are today. Slightly different, probably about five degrees Celsius cooler. Been more extreme probably in the tundra areas and the Arctic regions. But nevertheless, if you were in central Texas or let's say you're in Oklahoma or in Kansas, life was pretty good. Not so hot like we have our hot Texas summers, but a little cooler. And their animals responded to this in a big way. The Pleistocene is noteworthy for a number of reasons, but one of the first things is, is that we had megafauna. And when I mean megafauna, some of these are super megafauna, like they're mega megafauna, huge. And we were having ice ages that could allow this to occur, but we need to go back to what you learned in plate tectonics for the quaternary. Our ice ages came in cycles, right? So we had cold sections, for a longer stretch of time, so of over 100,000 years, there'd be about 80,000 years of that, and the remainder would be the interglacial times. Now, they vary in length, but that's about the right average, 80 to 20 ratio. In the Pleistocene epoch, one of the noteworthy animals of the grasslands area would have been the longhorn bison. They first came to the United States somewhere between 300 and 200,000 years ago, probably closer to the 200,000 year marker. Now, they're like modern bison, but you add about 25% body mass and three times longer in their horns. So we're talking about each horn being almost six feet long. That's pretty impressive, right? They lived in small groups, not giant herds like modern bisons do today, but they would have lived in forests. The Jefferson's ground sloth is a famous guy. That's this one over here, the one that looks like a big bear right there, but it's not a bear, it's a ground sloth. These, unlike the sloths of today, spent, they spent their time, or spend their times in trees, where these actually spent their time on grounds. These were pretty big animals. They got up to about 10 feet tall and about 1,000 plus kilograms. So that's large. And that's important because we'll look at what size animals went extinct at the end of the Ice Age and the thousand marker kilograms pretty much gets wiped off the planet at 100%. So these guys are going to go belly up at them. They had interesting peg-like teeth that were very blunt. So they had a, a purpose for that. They ate the stuff at the tops of, of trees like leaves, twigs, maybe even had a need to eat nuts. They would have lived in woodlands and forested areas where they could reach those trees. Megaloceros is a really famous animal from the last ice age. One place it's excluded in fossil finds is in North America. However, it is commonly found in Europe, Northern Asia, Northern Africa, and has a counterpart that's like it in China. Now it's called the Irish elk, sometimes referred to as the royal Irish elk. Now don't be deceived, it's not even closely related to an elk, really. It's a deer, it's a giant deer, and it's got a spread of antlers. You didn't misread that, 12 feet across. First time I saw one of these in a museum, I went, this has got to be like a jackalope, right? This can't be real. I was just a kid thinking, somebody hung those things on there, that just can't be. These are actually very common fossils where they're found. So this is a very famous guy and one that is noteworthy for living in, in the tundra regions of those parts of the world. Now you have to think about this. Deer lose their antlers once a year. Now if you're stuck in the forest with 12 feet across antlers, hmm. I'm not sure they spent all their time in the forest. I would think that would have been a challenge. You might have gotten stuck, and that had been a death sentence with predators in the neighborhood. Castoroides is another famous Pleistocene animal, and this was a giant beaver. I mean giant, huge. <laughs> We find these guys in North America. They lived through, all throughout the Ice Age. A little kind of interesting facts about them. They got up to 125 kilograms and 7 feet in length. 
So you have to imagine they had these big canines that came down that were about six inches long. So you thought the saber-toothed cat, known as the Smilodon, was the only guy with big fangs. Totally not the case. These teeth were not efficient at gnawing at wood, so these guys may or may not have built dams. Nevertheless, they were walking around around rivers at this time during the Pleistocene epoch. Camelops! Gotta love camelops. First, you need to know that camels evolved in North America, not in the places they live today. They migrated out of America. But camelops is famous for being one of the large giant camels of the Pleistocene epoch that went extinct at the end of the last ice age. So these guys stood about seven feet tall and weighed about 800 kilograms. They are very large. And so when you think about camelops, they didn't have the same humps that camels do today. So you have to understand they really didn't need them at the same time. This is a pretty good shot to look at this right here. Do you see the vertebrae extension? So that's usually an indicator of extra uh, muscle and tendon attachments needed for a reason. So my guess is camelops migrated regularly and we find camel fossils with uh, with mammoths. So we know that that's important because camels have really keen eyesight. Elephants do not. Glyptodots, the craziest thing ever, right? These are giant armadillos. Now I'd like you to picture a Volkswagen Beetle car and then just change its shape, make it a little flatter on top, and you got yourself the Glyptodont. <laughs> These are hilarious. They're funny. I mean, they're like, really? These guys were walking around? Yes, they were. These guys went extinct at the end of the last Ice Age. They were super heavily armored. And they were, we think they're herbivores. They sure appear to be, much like a modern-day armadillo, but they would feed on grasses and other plants along river beds and lakes. So basically a giant armadillo. Not so nice was the short-faced bear. So this guy got out competed after the last ice age and grizzly and black bears kind of took their place. But nevertheless, they, uh, they were very important bears and lived in proximity to some of our modern day bears. They just didn't make it. So nevertheless, their name comes from the shape of their face where they have a very, very short snout as compared to the size of their face. So that's why they get the name short, ba short face bear. They are one of the largest known mammalian carnivores on record in the fossils, uh, rock records. So it's important for you to know these guys were a big deal. They were in North America. They would have been as, as far south as the Ozark Mountains. So you would have expected to have found this as a, a very important predator at the time. Now, you can't talk about the Pleistocene without visiting the dire wolf. The dire wolf is an extinct carnivorous mammal very close in size to a modern day gray wolf, but had a much more stocky build and a much stronger bite. That's important to note. Got up to, at biggest size, 79 kilograms, with a more average somewhere between 50, probably 60-ish, 60 65-ish kilograms. They were almost five feet long, but what makes them so famous is the fact that we have so many of them in the fossil record. These guys, there are over 4,000 of them found in the La Brea tar pits alone. So dire wolves were common. I would think just about wherever you're watching this, if you're in North America, dire wolves would have lived. So important to note that these were very, very common animals of their time. Homotherium. So this is the scimitar cat. If you do not know what that is, it is a short shorter fang version of a Smilodon or saber-toothed cat. It is a version of a saber-toothed cat. And understand it was built a little bit different from Smilodons. It actually had a little bit better capability to run based on how it was, uh, its hind legs were made still, could ambush, but could actually run a little bit better than Smilodon. First appeared in the Pliocene, but would go extinct at the end of the last ice age. So these guys got up to 225 kilograms and were about the size of an African lion today. I would be very nervous about coming in contact with one of these in the last ice age because they were smart, they were agile, and they were killers. So you would have needed to watch out for them if you were lunch. 
Smilodon is by far the most famous of the Pleistocene saber-toothed cats. And let me interject here, there is no such thing as a saber-toothed tiger. Matter of fact, Smilodons are not related to tigers. So that's something that is important for you to take away from this is don't call them saber-toothed tigers anymore. They're saber-toothed cats. They're related closer to lions, so not tigers. They are a carnivorous animal that lived during the Pleistocene that had seven inch long fangs that came out as their incisor teeth right here. These canines, what makes this one so unique is that it had a jaw opening of 120 degrees. So you have to think about why. This guy would have had to have been a precision killer in order to get an animal because it would have had to open its jaw so wide at 120 degrees to get those big large fangs to do a puncture wound in exactly the right place. So these were ambush hunters. They were not built for necessarily long distance running. They were not, I mean, I'm sure they could sprint in a short distance, but they were designed to kind of hang out in the tree lines and scare you half to death and then scare you worse when they bite you, right? So Smilodons are an important fossil. There's been a number of them uh, found throughout the world. So they're very important. Uh, they didn't just evolve these big things for a reason, but obviously cats today did not carry them out. So basically the scimitar and Smilodon is the end of the lines here for them in terms of the cat family. All right, that brings us into mammoths. And I want to talk a little bit about mammoths before we get into woolly mammoths. The first is about their teeth. All mammoths get four teeth at one time. So two up here, two down here. There are different sizes as they grow up, but they get six sets. The first set are really little, and then they get a second set, and they're strategic in years of when you get them. I'm not going to test you on what year you get which set of teeth, but I'll tell you set six comes into their 40 ish year. In other words, they're in probably in their late 30s, early 40s by the time they get their sixth set. What is important is mammoths eat grass, and in grass is a mount of silica that is naturally in the soil, and so that is a super abrasive material that wears down these teeth. So after set six, there's no more places to get mammoth dentures put in, and so these guys end up dying of malnutrition. And if they haven't died already from some other reason. But nevertheless, that's one thing to talk about mammoths. The second is their tusk are really incisor teeth. And their tusk actually has growth rings, much like a tree. And there's a lot we can learn about that. We can actually tell the type of diet that they had. And there's studies even going on at the Waco Mammoth site that is looking at this very thing. So some interesting research will be coming out that you can learn more about this particular aspect of mammoths. So let's talk about woolly mammoths. They lived in during the Pleistocene, but they would have lived up by the tundra edge of the continental ice sheets that were coming down and even the valley glacier ice sheets that were coming down. Asian elephants are their closest living relatives. So the woolly mammoth really isn't that different, but has some different characteristics than modern day Asian elephants do. One of the things I'd like you to consider is they were about the size of an African elephant. So they were the smaller of the mammoth bunch, much smaller than the Colombian mammoth. These guys still are huge, 11 feet tall and up to six tons. These kinds of animals, depending on which mammoth you were looking at, ate hundreds of pounds of food a day, required over 30 to 40 gallons of water a day, and produced, you can imagine how much waste product they produced, right? So we're kind of looking along the lines of the same issues of the sauropods from the late Jurassic. They produced some issues <laughs> with their waste. So the woolly mammoth had two layers of fur. One was kind of like what I would call your insulating layer, and then they had the protective layer on the outside that gave them the long hair. So today, we have some specimens of woolly mammoths that are somewhat complete. I mean, people seem to think they're in perfect condition. Well, that's just far-fetched. I mean, most of them have been well-preserved, and we even have some fur to pull from. And DNA evidence shows that mammoths came in brunettes, blondes, and redheads. So you can't 
very well say that all woolly mammoths were exactly the same. But anyway, they're neat and for neat creatures. We didn't have them in Texas, but if you lived up north near the ice sheets, let's say near New York, or you lived up in Canada, or you're up in the northern states, you would have seen potentially woolly mammoths. Now, they were more common in Siberia. But the types of mammoths that moved further south where it was a little warmer are the Colombian mammoths. Colombian mammoths are one of the largest species of mammoths alive. And you've got to just really contemplate how huge 13 feet tall is. If you're looking at a light post, that's all the, almost to the top. It's a pretty huge animal. And these guys got up to 10 tons. Imagine how much grass they had to eat a day to stay alive. It just blows my mind, right? They lived in open grasslands in places like Texas and Oklahoma, even further south in Central America. So these guys are widespread. The Colombian mammoth was truly a megafauna of its time. Well, that brings me to the end of the Pleistocene. The Pleistocene had a targeted extinction event. This extinction event occurred around 11,000 to 10,000 years ago, where megafauna that was more than 1,000 kilograms went extinct 100%. If you were an herbivore and you were 100 to or more kilograms, you went belly up about 75% of the population. If they were less than 100, you got about 41% of herbivores. So some kind of massive change to food resources for these animals must have occurred. So you can see that those really tiny herbivores didn't get affected by this whatever change happened. So there's a number of hypotheses, and each has some good compelling evidence. So it's hard to say exactly what happened that triggered this, and I would think somewhere down the line we'll get a clearer picture when more scientific studies are conducted. My thoughts are probably a combination with one in particular that kind of finished off the job. So let's take a look at them. For sure, hunting definitely deteriorated numbers, but I have some questions as to what size human population of things like Clovis people would it taken to have wiped out every megafauna on the planet. So that's one of my concerns with that, but we know that humans populated in a fairly fast manner. The scientific data that's out there on human hunting suggested that the keystone megafauna got hunted and could not reproduce, which led to a die-off of being unable to have viable offspring, getting back to uh, sexual fitness that we learned about in evolution. The whole deal is, can you produce and reproduce offsprings that can produce more of the same? So that could have easily been a contributing factor, and many people think it is the primary factor of what killed off megafauna at the end of the Pleistocene. The hyper-disease theory, don't laugh, there's actually some information that's important on this one. As humans expanded into the same areas and habitats as megafauna, they probably would have had domesticated animals, and they themselves could have easily carried diseases, even the animals that they had as domesticated pets. So as these animals came in contact, they easily could have spread diseases. So that's definitely a likely possibility that contributed, but I don't think it's the sole cause of why megafauna went extinct. Now, most people immediately point to rapid climate change. We know there was a rapid climate change at the end of the Pleistocene. So why did that change megafauna? Certainly, it would have had an influence on flora, plants. But it also could have produced a chance for flooding and trapping some of these animals, which would also lead to a reproduction problem if your reproductive-aged animals can no longer do so. So we know rainfall patterns changed, the fauna changed, the flora changed, but we do see a massive die-off at the end of the Pleistocene of all of our large megafauna. So interesting to think about what that is, and that's an area of, of study that is worthy of more exploration. So let's cover the Cenozoic life history highlights and kind of make sure you've got all the places in the right order. Mammals were tiny in the Pliocene. Mammals were tiny and small in the Paleocene, but by the end of that 10 million year time frame, we had a lot of variety, including a few big ones, which was unusual. 
Then we had that big global warming event called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. And after that, animals got small, but then they had a chance of recovery during the Eocene where we saw artiodactyl and perseodactyls radiate very quickly. Anthropoids evolved in the Eocene and will diverge again, and we would see Old World and New World monkeys come about in the Oligocene. Grasslands were a major story of expansion along with the animals that fed on them during the Miocene. The Pliocene was a time of migration between North and South America as we exchanged mammals that would move to both continents. We know megafauna dominated the landscape and ecosystem during the Pleistocene only to experience a targeted extinction event at the end of the Pleistocene. So we'll see you back for our lesson on hominids and see you back then. Bye.